Howdy, y'all. Name's Fireball with TexasTrailBoss.com. Howdy, and good evening. Pleasure to meet you. Today, I've got a story for you. This has to be one of the absolute greatest cattle drive stories I have ever heard of from one of the original drovers on the cattle drives in the late 1800s. If it's not by, by far the absolute greatest that you will ever hear, it may in fact probably be one of the funniest. So go ahead and just tell you a little bit. This cattle dri drover, his name is Jack Potter of Kenton, Oklahoma. And he starts off his story back in the spring of 1882. So it's, it's towards the later portion of the cattle drives. So, and often what originally happened during the original, during the very beginning of the cattle drives is they would drive the cattle, usually from South Texas, something like that, up to Ogala, they would go to Kansas, they'd go to Abilene, Kansas, they'd go to a destination that usually had a railhead there. Uh, they would drop off the cattle to a buyer, the buyer would then take the cattle, put them on rail, and would ship them to other parts of the country. Well, towards the later part of the cattle drives, the buyer would end up buying the cattle as well as the horses. But what about the drovers? They had to get back home. That, that's usually where the story here gets mighty interesting. The cattle drovers ended up having to get a cowboy ticket. This was provided by the outfit that they were riding for that they would ride the rail with this cowboy ticket all the way back from their original cattle drive railhead destination all the way back home. Well, in this gentleman, Jack Potter from Kenton, Oklahoma, in his circumstance back in the spring of 1882, he was actually 2,000 miles away from home already and his outfit wanted to send him back to Texas, which was not home for him, to pick up another cattle trail or cattle drive to drive all the way back up to the railheads. Well, in his particular instance, well, let me just go ahead and read what he wrote here. So, now reader, here I was a boy, not yet 17 years old, 2,000 miles from home. I had never been on a railroad train. I had never slept in a hotel, never taken a bath in a bathhouse, and from boyhood, I had heard all the terrible stories about the ticket thieves, money changers, pickpocketers, three-card Monty, and other robbing schemes. And I had horrors about this, my very first railroad trip. He goes on to talk about one of the greatest stories about how he's, he's so nervous about his luggage. He had a, you know, a second-hand trunk that he had put his saddles, Colt 45s in, he put his change of clothes in, and he did not trust anyone to take care of his baggage to make sure it went from train car to train car when they, when they stopped to change trains or, you know, when they stayed overnight at a location. He didn't trust that it would get back onto the train. So he had a lot of time trying to confront this. But well into his second day, he was now coming to kind of be a little bit more familiar about riding on a train, but not completely just yet. So that's where we hit this portion right here. That night at 12 o'clock, we reached Dodge City where I had to lay over for 24 hours. I thought everything would be quiet in town at that hour of the night. But I soon found out they never slept in Dodge. They had a big dance hall there, which was to Dodge City what Jack Harris Theater was to San Antonio. I arrived at the hall in time to see a gambler and a cowboy mix-up in a six-shooter duel. Lots of smoke, a stampede, but no one killed. I secured a room and retired. When morning came, I arose and fared forth to see Dodge City by daylight. It seemed to me that the town was full of cowboys and cattle owners. The first acquaintance I met was George W. Saunders, now the president and chief rumadero of Old, Old Trail Drivers. I also found Jesse Personnel and Slim Johnson there, as well as several others whom I knew down in Texas. Parsnell said to me, Jack, you will have lots of company on your way home. Old Dogface Smith is up here from Catula, and he and his whole bunch are going back tonight. Old Dogface is one of the best trail men that ever drove a cow, but he was all worked up about having to go back on the train. 
I wish you would help them along down the line in changing the cars. That afternoon, I saw a couple chuck wagons loaded with punchers who had on the same clothing they were on the trails with. Their pants stuck into their boots and their spurs were on. They were bound for San Antonio. Old Dogface Smith was a typical Texan, about 30 years of age with long hair, three months growth of on his whiskers. He wore a blue shoot, a blur, a blue shirt, and a red cotton handkerchief around his neck. He had a bright, intelligent face that bore the appearance of a good trail hand, which no doubt was the cause of people calling him Old Dog Face. It seemed a long time that night to wait for the train, and we put in time visiting every saloon in town. There was a big stug poker game going in one place, and I saw one fellow Texan whose name I will not mention lose an entire herd of cattle at the game. But he, might, he may have won it back by daybreak. I will never forget seeing that train come into Dodge City that night. Old Dogface and his bunch were pretty badly frightened and we had considerable difficulty getting them on the train. It was about 12.30 when the train pulled out. The conductor came around and I gave him my cowboy ticket. It was almost as long as your arm. He tore off a chunk, chunk of it and I said, what authority do you have to tear up a man's ticket? He laughed and he said, you're in my division. I simply tore off one coupon, and each conductor between here and San Antonio will tear off one for each division. That sounded all right, but I wondered if that ticket would hold out all the way down to Texas. Everyone seemed a bit tired and wore out, and the bunch began bedding down. Old Dogface was out of humor and was the last one to bed down. At about, three at about 3 o'clock, our train was sidetracked to let the westbound train pass. This little stop caused the boys to sleep the sounder. Just then, and this is where it gets good, y'all. Just then, the westbound train sped by, traveling at a rate of about 40 miles an hour. And just as it passed our coach, the engineer blew the whistle. Talk about your stampedes. <laughs> this bunch of sleeping cowboys arose as one man and started on the run with old Dogface Smith in the lead. I was a little slow in getting off, but fell in with the drags. I had not yet woke up, but was thinking... This was a genuine cattle stampede. I yelled out, circle your leaders and keep up the drags. Just then the leaders circled, ran, ran into the drags, dragging some of us down. They circled again and the new butcher crawled out from under a foot and jumped through a window like he was a frog. Before they could circle back the next time, the train crew pushed in the door and caught old face. And soon the bunch quieted down. The conductor was pretty angry and threatened to have us transferred to the freight department and loaded on the stock cars. Y'all! Oh my goodness! <laughs> Can you imagine a bunch of cowboys for the first time riding on a train car and getting spooked in the middle of the night, jumping up with their Colt 45s, running around thinking it's a full-blown cattle stampede? Oh, this is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> and I tell you what, that train conductor, you know, you know they thought it had to be an absolute spectacle. But here, let's let's proceed. We had breakfast at Hutchinson, and after eating, and we're again on our way, speeding through the beautiful farms and thriving towns of Kansas. We organized a kangaroo court and tried the engineer. <laughs> We organized a kangaroo court and tried the engineer of that westbound train for disturbing the peace of the passengers on the eastbound train. We heard testimony all morning and called in some of the train crew to even testify. One of the brakemen said it was an old trick of that engineer to blow that whistle at that particular sighting and that he was undoubtedly the cause of many stampedes. The jury brought in a verdict of guilty and assessed the death penalty. <laughs> it was ordered 
that he be captured, taken to some place on the western trail, there to be hogtied like a steer, and to have a road brand applied with a good hot iron, and a herd of not less than 5,000 longhorn steers made to stampede and trample all over his body. Yo! <laughs> you want to talk about western justice there in the cattle drive times? Boom! Right there! They got spooked into a stampede. Ended up setting up a kangaroo court <laughs> and tried that westbound engineer and found him guilty of disturbing the peace of the passengers and was punished to death. Y'all, he was to be taken out on the train, out on the trails, and branded with a road brand, which is the brand that they stuck on the, cow, on the cattle when they hit the trails. And then he was to be trampled on by a stampede of no less than 5,000 longhorn steers. Now, I'll be honest, I, I can't find any mention of a herd that big coming on one trail drive just all by itself. The most that I found in the book so far is 4,500 head. But tell you what, this is the book that I am reading. The Trail Drivers of Texas. This was a book absolutely marvelous. So this book was actually compiled sometime in the 1920s. And it was compiled from stories of the original cattle drivers that drove cattle back in the late 1800s. So they all came together for a meeting, and they were old men by this point, and they were talk, talking tall tales and telling lies about, you know, times of yesterday, knowing full well those times were long gone and it would never be the same. Some of their dates are slightly off. Some of the locations are slightly off. But y'all, can you imagine what these men lived through? And not just men, sometimes they were women. Absolutely incredible, the stories in this book. But this particular story even goes on. We had a several, several hour layover at Emporia, Kansas, where we took the M, K, and T for Parsons, getting on the main line through the Indian Territory to Denison, Texas. There was a large crowd of punchers on the through train who were returning from Ogala, by the way, of Kansas City and Omaha. As we were traveling through the territory, old Dogface said to me, Peter, I expect it was me that started that stampede up in Kansas, but I just couldn't help it. You see, I took on a scare once, and since that time, I've been on a hair trigger when suddenly awakened. By the year 1875, me and old wild horse Jerry were camped at a water hole out west of the Nuches River, where we were snaring Mustangs. Y'all keep mind, I can't say this name here. There's a little fly flying around in here. But I can't say this name, so please forgive me. One evening, a couple of Pelachones, P-E-L-O-N-C-I-A-S, pitched camp nearby. And the next morning, our Remuda was missing, all except our night horses. Something to kind of keep in mind, a Remuda was the whole gathering the horses. That, that's usually what they called them on a cattle drive. So on the cattle drive... They had a bunch of horses that were called the Remuda. I also told Wild Horse Jerry to hold down the camp and watch the snares. And I hit the trail of those Pelachones were headed for Rio Grande. I followed it for about 40 miles and lost all signs. It was nightfall, so I made camp, prepared supper, and rolled up in my blanket and went to sleep. I don't know how long I slept, but I was awakened by a low voice saying, something in Spanish here. And don't mind my dog out there barking. She's telling me it's time to eat. But basically, the Spanish translate into, let him rest well. He will soon start his journey to the other world. Doesn't sound good. It was the two Mexican horse thieves huddled up around the campfire, smoking their cigarettes and taking it easy, as they thought they had the drop on me. As I came out of my bed, two bullets whizzed past my head. But about that time, my old Colt, Colt 45 began talking, and the janitor down in Hades had two more pelachones on his hands. Ever since that night, if I am awakened suddenly, I generally come out on all fours roaring like a buffalo bull, and I never sleep on a bedstead, for it would not be safe for me, as I might break my darn neck. So I always spread down on the floor. 
Y'all, this is absolutely incredible. I urge you, y'all take a look at this book. These cattle drive stories are something marvelous. And they're just something, just a little bit of something that I have in store for this channel. As a breeder of the Texas Registered Longhorns, we are going to be talking about the, the marvelous history of the Texas Longhorns, stemming all the way back to the 1400s and talking about their near extinction in the 1920s. We'll be talking about their, their resurgence in modern times and what saved them. We'll talk about how they single-handedly helped save America following the Civil War and why they are the native beef of Texas. We'll also dive into a little bit about the lean beef and how they can be a healthy alternative to some of the other choices that are out there. So y'all make sure to stand by because we are going to have a wealth of fantastic thing to discuss on this YouTube channel. Thank you all for tuning in and vaya con Dios. Until next time.